Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm doing an impression of Joe Devine and today I'm joined by the mercurial Alex Stewart. Hello Alex. Hello JJ. That's right because I'm not Joe. No I had to catch myself for a moment. Yeah, there. I, I, bet, was... I bet everyone thought I was Joe. Yes even I for a second and I can actually see you in person. And I'll keep doing Joe's uh, mannerisms throughout this show because he's not here he's on holiday doing holiday things. Yeah. And um, what we're going to talk about today, it's going to be a lot of, obviously, football. I think we are going to talk about Arsenal and Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Arsenal are doing well, aren't they? Um, Liverpool and Burnley. How about Saints and Manchester United? Why not? Why not? The Chuck Saints go marching in. in. Or wow. do they? We don't know. I can't remember what the score was. But also, foreign football. Because we like, <laughs> we like that. We do. Um, so yeah, Seb's meant to also be here, but... Someone is drilling like the side of his house, so he can't, he can't even join us from the internet. This is a real shame. Um, but you know what isn't a real shame? Tell me what isn't a real shame. Being able to read about football. Oh. And the best place to do that, I would say, is The Athletic. And for a limited time, you can uh, read The Athletic. You can always read The Athletic, but you can subscribe to The Athletic using the code TIFO. So if you go to theathletic.com forward slash TIFO, you can get, I believe, it's a 30-day free trial a free trial for 30 days and then you can uh you can keep reading it and i would um because there are many great articles like uh joey darso's piece on the socios cryptocurrency thing yeah i also really enjoyed the um the piece that phil hay had a part of on on how to sell a footballer who doesn't want to be sold that was very entertaining i also enjoyed that i would add that phil hay is really nice he is and on that note, I'm going to leave you in the even nicer, but possibly not warmer hands and cool embrace of Alex Stewart. Here we go. Arsenal nil to Chelsea. An interesting thing here for someone on the notes is that uh, a lack of adaption, adaptation, I should say. No, which is the right one? Doesn't matter. During the game from Mikel Arteta, because Arsenal haven't started this season very well at all. And... Um, there does seem to be an awful lack of things being done to address that, would you say? Yeah, so uh, this, this, was, this was me in the notes. Oh, good, and well, that's very handy that you're here. Assiduously adding <laughs> things at half past eight this morning. Um, yeah, it just, it felt like, it felt like Arsenal started relatively well. Um, and in fact, I think I put in the WhatsApp group, Arsenal look okay, question mark. And then five minutes later, I, I obviously rode back from that opinion vigorously. But that kind of short spell at the beginning aside, um, Chelsea were just entirely dominant, weren't they? And and this was this was partly because of Lukaku and what Lukaku was doing and, and how quickly he's adapted to that Chelsea system, which isn't a massive surprise. Um, but it was also because Arsenal were leaving themselves exposed, you know, particularly down the left-hand side. We talked in the last podcast, I think, about how Kieran Tierney is expected to be all things to all men. And that that just meant that, uh, you know, his spacing was either way, way too narrow because he was desperately trying to help out Mary, who had a terrible game, uh, or he was trying to be the only creative outlet uh, in support higher up the pitch. And of course, particularly against a system that uses wing backs, that's a recipe for disaster. So... What I think, you know, you could see Xhaka trying to sort of drop out to that left-hand side to cover over a little bit, but there was no response from Arsenal, either tactically or really in terms of how the players kind of rallied to that early, brutal shoveling. And it looked at, you know, sort of 30, 35 minutes in that it could be a cricket score. I mean, I didn't see at any point in that game that Arsenal would ever have won it. No. It, it, yeah, Chelsea with total control. The other thing I thought was odd, maybe not odd, but it's not as if they don't know what Lukaku does right. or what he is. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, his first goal was in 15 minutes. And his the, the way he linked play for that is something that you can see him doing countless times in other teams. Yeah. yeah just completely drawn out. Well, it's, uh, what's what I found interesting about this was that in... Okay, so Lukaku is an addition to the Chelsea team, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, maybe there's a little bit of uncertainty there. But like you said, Lukaku 
was doing exactly what Lukaku does. You know, that sort of take the ball into feet, spin it wide, move off the shoulder, you know, use his physical ability, sure, but also the timing of his runs and everything. There's nothing, like it's hard to stop, but it's not something wildly different from what Lukaku was doing all of last season. And Chelsea... Uh, Tuchel's very good at little adaptations during the course of games, but also Chelsea are very, very predictable tactically. So you kind of felt like, you know, no one is going into this game thinking that Lukaku's going to play any differently or that Chelsea's going to play any differently. Yeah. And yet Arteta seemed to be like, oh. I mean, I'm sure Arteta knows an awful lot more about coaching than I mean, he does. He certainly he does. He does. An yeah. awful lot. I mean, lots of people do than, yeah. than I, for example. But, I mean, there are videos, I think, where Lukaku has just been hanging out with Jamie Carragher doing a little coaching thing where he shows you exactly why he wants the defender to get shirt tight to him mm -hmm. because you can easily roll him. Yeah. And either the lack of awareness by, I think it's Mari, it's drawn out every time to him, or the coaching staff who haven't coached him to know how to deal with this particular thing. Either he was too far off him or he was too tight, and every time, like the minute Lukaku dropped to, to receive that ball as back to goal, and then played it wide, this kind of thing I think Alan Shearer used to do quite a lot, he would get the ball so he could play it to then go and receive it. Yeah. Everyone it, watching that game knew exactly what was going to happen. Yeah. It was... And that, that again is one of the issues with the way that Tierney was exposed by... Was it the second goal he got? Yeah. Out of position, yeah. You know, what do you think of this? Is it, was he out of position? Is it his fault? I mean, it, it's slightly his fault, but also I, I do feel like the, the system contributes to this enormously. Mm -hmm. um, and and we know that Arsenal have done this in the past where, uh, particularly in build-up, uh, Granite Jacker will drop out into that kind of left wing back, left back slot that allows Tierney to push really high. Whoever is playing left and side forward can then drift into the left half space and it creates this kind of unbalanced system, uh, unbalanced, asymmetrical. It's not a bad thing necessarily if it works. Um, but because Tierney is kind of got half an eye on the fact that his centre-back colleagues are having a mare, but also that if Arsenal are to get anything out of this game, he needs to be the person going forwards and contributing those cutbacks Particularly because, I mean, they, they had almost no presence in the box. I mean, Martinelli was dropping off so deep all the time that it's like, you know, what, what's he going to do? So I think, again, that's the sort of thing where a coach needs to say, or perhaps another player on the team needs to say, and I fear in this issue, it's it's in this instance, it's because Tierney is like the, the strongest character in the mm -hmm. squad. So he's not going to say it to himself. Um it's like he's trying to take responsibility, so he's trying to do too much because he knows something right. needs to be done. So, so somebody at that point, whether it's Jacka or whether it's Arteta, needs mm -hmm. to say, like, you know, you have to balance these things. You, you can't, you can't try and do everything, particularly in a back four against a back three with wing backs, and particularly when that wing back that you're up against, Rhys James, is so adept at exploiting space and getting crosses in. And when you've got a striker who likes to drift slightly out towards that side and release, like it was just a recipe for disaster, really. N none of it made like tactical sense. But then worse than the, I mean, tactics is obviously very important, but the... Tactics is everything. Tactics is everything. And the vibe, I think, is important. I really do. Sometimes the vibe matters And also. the players just don't look anywhere near. I think Chelsea looked incredibly well coached. Yeah. They also had better players. Like the only one in that entire Arsenal team you think would get near the Chelsea team is probably Tierney, I think. Even then, yeah, I think yes. I mean, Smith Rowe had some nice moments, but um, that's the thing. It's always yeah. <laughs> nice. and I think it's interesting. I think Lukonga settled in really well, actually. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of the switch passes he did out to, t well, not proper switch passes because he was more tucked in, but releasing Tierney on the left hand side, I thought that was really good. You know, he looks like a promising acquisition. Um, but again, I feel like you know, for example, the way. The way that Arsenal were constructing play felt at once too rehearsed, but also the good bits came from a kind of uh, moments of improvisation, usually by Smith Rowe when he injected a little bit of dynamism. If you, it doesn't matter how good Kieran Tierney is, and he is very, very good. Obviously, we we know that you like him. I like him also. But I do like. If he's the only thing that's happening, 
it does become quite easy to stop. And and it's not necessarily about his ability to get forwards and whip those crosses in. Because he did that a few times. He you know, he did manage to do that. But if you've got three good centre backs who are able to drop off and just go, okay, well, you can cross it in as much as you like, because we'll be here, and you've got no centre who's, forward. Yeah, who's so, going to head it? Right. He did uh, uh, He did start hitting low crosses, which must be that Arteta's clicked the button that, you know, you hit low crosses only, mm. which is sensible to me. I don't know. I mean, Chelsea just looks so much better. I uh, don't want to do any hot takes, but I really think they'll be probably one of the best teams that, like looking for to win the title. I just don't see weaknesses in them at the moment. No, I don't think so. And I think I think the thing with Tuchel is that he has a very clear blueprint for how he wants to play. There mm. is there are certain facets of how Chelsea are now playing that occurred within a game or two of him taking up that position. You know, the 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 tight midfield double pivot, for example, straight away reducing the distance between those two players was something that immediately solidified their middle, the, the use of Rudiger to bring the ball out, all of these kinds of things. You you just look at that and go, this is a team who they know exactly what they're supposed to do when they go onto the pitch in, in almost every circumstance. I think Mendy has really grown into his role as, as a goalkeeper. I think he is very a lot more comfortable in possession than he was. I think some of his passing was really good yesterday. Havertz was kind of drifting around more, showing those little bursts of pace and stuff that he had at Leverkusen. Like it's just, and then you look at the bench, and you <laughs> think, oh, okay. So yeah. the you know. bench should be like top ten, <laughs> easy. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, the title, yeah, it's it surely between them and and City, and oh, but how about Liverpool two nil Burnley? Oh, what a segue! And we're, we're all we're about in. segues today, aren't we? I like segues. We're in. Um, now, they also will probably be in amongst it later on in the season. They started quite well. Uh, they beat the Burnley, who I think were, how am I going to phrase this? They were quite up for it <laughs> and definitely wanted to let the Liverpool players know that they were there. Yeah. That's yeah. what I noticed. That Lots was... of strong challenges, particularly in Harvey Elliott. They seem to not like him. Well, yes. And I mean, I'm all for strong challenges, but the... the strong bit... but fair. The bit where, I, I can't remember who did it to whom, but basically put his arms around, it was Jota. Jota was yeah, coming in for it's a not lot. Someone like held Jota ever so gently and then sort of flipped him like like he was ejecting a drunk from a pub. And <laughs> yeah. that, I don't know, is it too much? It was more the like, again, I, I like this thing with the referees where they're, the idea is to stop players being able to buy fouls. So there's too much of players know that if they go down in certain situations, they're going to get a free kick. And I don't like it. Particularly, I think, a defender's waiting to see a ball out for a for a goal kick and the player comes behind him and shock, oh, he's gone down at the slightest of touches and now it's now a free kick and the play is safe. I think that needs to end. That needs to go away. But I also like slide tackles, but not when you go in quite strong-legged, like hard early on. Because it, both players can't go in like that because if they do, then they're going to both end up yeah. in bits. So one has to pull out and Burnley were just got launched into it. And it's something that um, Klopp was, I think, was he moaning about. He, he he said that they were maybe being a bit too... Yeah, I, I think... Aggressive. I, yeah. I mean, there, there have been... Uh, we'll come on to talk about Southampton Man United later, but there have been complaints from certain managers this weekend about the degree to which physicality is ramped up and that this latitude that the referees are allowing uh, has, I think, negative potential for players. I think Klopp had more of a point yeah, uh, I agree. than yeah. Solskjaer did. Oh, he has no um, point at all. No. I don't, I don't <laughs> we'll talk so. about that later. But then I'm yeah. biased. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I don't know, my, my concern is that, yes, obviously we want to encourage free-flowing football we want to I personally again as a as a Southampton fan I think where teams are allowed to press very assertively uh in a way that you know that kind of refereeing facilitates that's probably a good thing mm -hmm. at the same time we are also coming off a period where one of the overriding narratives of the last 18 months has been 
player fatigue, player care, you know, the fact that Pedri is still going has kind of become a meme. Um, and and rather than going, okay, well, we've only just finished the Euro, what, like three weeks ago? I don't know, time turns to quick. That seems too little. Sure, four weeks, five weeks, who can say? Time goes on. Um, but time is, yeah, anyway. the um, I think the problem is that, that this refereeing change it's well intentioned and there are aspects of it that are great but it's also coming at a point when everyone's already really knackered and the the potential for injury is just well i mean on that note virgil van dijk is back he is uh, he suffered a bad injury he was out for quite a long time um and Alex, you've said that there's a lot of hot takes about him sorting out Liverpool's offensive problems. So, if you will, yeah, please tell me whether Virgil van Dijk has or has not sorted out Liverpool's offensive problems. Okay, so he played a really good pass <laughs> for, for the goal. Um, uh, yeah. Also, uh, beautiful. I mean, that was that was a beautiful goal. Like that's the, the boy's got a ping on him. Take yeah. anything away from that, I thought. Trent Alexander-Arnold's movement inside and the little dinked pass through. Just sublime from start to finish. Um, but two things. Firstly, it's the availability heuristic, right? It's just happened, therefore it's the only thing we can think about. Um, and, and sort of reaching for evidence for a conclusion that you want to draw on the basis of one thing that catches your eye because it's a really good thing and it results in a goal. I think that's kind of silly. Um, the second thing is, we are two games into the season. So basically, anybody drawing any conclusions about anything, and I massively include myself in this, uh, is a bit foolish. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't know why anyone's That's listening I'm here. <laughs> to this, because anything that we say is basically not going to be proven to be true. But it, yeah, I, yes, they, they, hmm, they missed his passing to a degree, but he's not the only person who can pass that kind of ball in, in Liverpool's team. They tried to compensate last season by, you know, having Thiago dropping and playing as a pivot and being able to play those passes from a bit deeper and so on. It does allow them to compress the space, move up the pitch higher, play those passes from further back with more players ahead of the ball. That's obviously a good thing. But I think, I think, Phrasing it in such a way as to say that Virgil van Dijk's return has solved Liverpool's attacking problems, uh, like A, overstates the degree to which they had attacking problems last season, and B, overstates the importance of Virgil van Dijk, given all of the other players and all of the other things that happen. Mm. So yeah, sorry if you wrote that article <laughs> or articles, but yeah. It's been disproven now. I did like a lot. Um, how Alexander Arnold they seem to have changed the system a bit to get him more into more central positions. So you'd often find him playing as basically an eighth mm. a lot of the time in the same positions you'd find Kevin De Bruyne or David Silva at uh, uh, City. Um, and you noticed that they keep the width by moving Elliot wide. Is that what they did? Yeah. So they they would they, it would either be Elliot sometimes it would be Salah. But but I think oh it, yeah that was later on though was it Salah was yeah it wide yeah. Um, it, I think it's really interesting because I think it, it goes to, to sort of prove uh, two or three points, really, that Klopp is, is able to adapt. Right? He's able to, to learn things from what other people are doing. For example, potentially the use of Cancelo at Manchester City. And mm -hmm. there was that period where you know, Liverpool were, were associated with marauding fullbacks, a very pedestrian ball-winning midfield three, and then this kind of lovely interplay fluid front three. But you could like, you could know exactly how Liverpool were going to play every game. And because they had such good players, it was very, very effective. Um, this is another adaptation. And I think Klopp's adaptations tend to go in like maybe two season cycles. Alexander-Arnold also has the ability to play in that central midfield role. Like, he's really good at passing from wide, but I think some of his best passing, crossing, comes, like, exactly like you said, from that sort of De Bruyne right half space. Yeah, for sure. Whipping the ball in to players that are running forwards. Um, and also, it it's a naturally sensible way to use Harvey Elliott. 
who I thought looked good, although probably not as good as some of the pundits were suggesting after the game. Like, oh, he looks like he's been there for 10 years. I yeah, I thought he looked quite... Like, I mean, understandably nervous. And yeah, a little he bit. had moments that were great, yeah. and and there's there's clearly a very very promising player. Yes, but there. he is English and young, and therefore right. is going so to be worth two hundred million within a year. Hyperbole, Claxon needs yeah. to be <laughs> smashed. Um, but you know, he he feels more comfortable in a wider position, where you can use his ball carrying and his pace as well. He has played as an eight on loan a few times, but not that regularly. So I think. That this is a sensible adaptation that Klopp's made for a variety of different reasons. Whether Elliot's going to be like a regular thing this season or not, I, who knows? But in those sort of circumstances, I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, I think we should move on to um, to Manchester United and Southampton, but we should do that after taking a very short break. And we're back. Southampton won, won Manchester United. A weird game, it says here. It was weird. United should have been 4-0 up, but then um, Ralf Hasenhüttl changed something at halftime that brought them victory. What, does, what was that that he did? <laughs> less, less victory. Um, oh yeah, they didn't win. Did they? they didn't actually <laughs> win, no. Um, yeah. Uh, a moral victory, perhaps. So it's, it's worth noting that... Um, <clears throat> so United looked really, really good for most of the first half. Um Pogba drifting inside to that kind of weird hybrid, sometimes left wing, sometimes sort of Matsala 8 type of thing. Yeah. Worked really, really well. Um, their set pieces were excellent. Um, so they brought in Eric Ramsey over the summer to work on their set pieces and, and they posed Southampton real problems, particularly Pogba making these late runs around the back towards the far post. Was it Shaw taking them mostly? Or uh, sure or Bruno depending on which side they were and and they're both really really good set piece takers mm -hmm. so it like it makes sense you know United have got some tall players who are good in the air Pogba's good in the air Maguire's excellent in the air McTominay as well is good in that sort of thing um which is nice for him. <laughs> it's good at something um but it so it made sense and Southampton somehow mostly through Mohamed Salah who throwing himself in the way of everything escaped from that period only one nil down and then Hassan Hootl took off Theo Walcott and actually Walcott and Gineppo were pressing really well in the wide areas um, but he switched to a back five brought Gineppo infield into this kind of slightly weird role where he could he could defend centrally in a 5-3-2 block but he could also drift out and facilitate attacks down the left hand side when that was happening um, and Perro would sort of either overlap or underlap, depending on where Gineppo went. Um, and it worked. It worked really well. And, and United, United aren't amazingly good at progressing the ball through central midfield. I think that's a fair comment. That's why a lot of people feel that they should have more of a ball-playing defensive midfielder. And as soon as Hassan Hootl went to that three that could be bulked out, particularly by Livramento pushing up uh, to, to cut, Shaw's space down. He's the young boy they signed from Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, he was. He looked really. He won fantastic. man of the match, I think, or something. Yes. Didn't he? Yeah. yeah, he did. I, I thought maybe that was a bit much. Um, but he's young and English. <laughs> I'm full of positivity today, aren't I? Yeah. Um, but yes, he no, he was great. There was one bit where he just made Fred look so unserious. I'm starting to funny. like Fred. Well, uh, I think I always sort of. I, I've noticed a lot with what Fred's been doing with United is he seems to be really important to how that he's got a real, um, what am I trying to say here? He, he hurries things up. Like he wants to win the ball back. He wants to get them going forward and he covers for everyone else. So even though it seems like he's not doing an awful lot of that, I think we talked about this a bit last week. Um, he just fills in for spaces. You see him often in like the right backs position, filling in when wan Basaka would go forward. Interesting that he went for Matic and Fred rather than McTominay in this game. I'm not sure if that was because of Sort of an injury that McTominay had or something like that. But McTominay came on, I thought he was really good again. Again, just trying to drive it forward. Yeah, I think I think the, the problem is that I, I agree with you on Fred. Um, uh, Fred's a weird one because when he was at Shakhtar, he was, you know, he was somebody who would drop back towards the defensive line, carry the ball forward, spray past it. Like he was a lot more creative and progressive for Shakhtar. Right. Um, at United, he's kind of been turned into like a, a, a ball winner, presser, busy, energetic kind of gap filler. 
Yeah. And I think he's good at that, but I also think that that shows up his deficiencies in possession because there isn't somebody else that's able to do that. Like he's changed his role so much. He's yeah. sort of half He takes a lot of touches, to, I've noticed. A he, lot. He does. And I think that, that United's midfield pivot is not great at finding space. Now, bearing in mind they're playing against a Southampton team who like actively just want to ruin you every time you've got the ball. So, and, and Ward, Prowse and Romeo excel at that. Yeah. So it, it's it's not an easy circumstance. Um, but I guess, you know, that's why you've got Pogba tucking back inside because he can become that that progressive passer a little bit more. I don't know. It feels like United, are, they, they have a lot of good stuff and then there's a little issue in the middle. And it's not been fixed yet. Well, one of the issues in this game was that Bruno Fernandes kept crying about barely losing the ball. Because, uh, yeah. I mean, is there a person around alive who isn't a Man United supporter who thinks that's a foul? Uh, Graham Souness. Graham Souness said that was a foul? Mm-hmm. I know. Game, game's gone, <laughs> JJ. Game's gone. Roy Keane was like It's that. almost like he just wants to have a contrarian opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Um, yeah, Roy Keane said it wasn't a foul, which... I don't think it was a foul. No. For me, so I think he needs to be stronger or shield the ball better. And I think it's an exact example that we're talking about, the, the free kicks that players would expect to buy. So he, mm-hmm. he knows that the challenge is coming. And if he, if he just waits, gets contact, he can go down. I think the guy comes in, it's not a strong even challenge. It's just kind of a... Well, it is a strong challenge, but it's not, aggr- it's not overly aggressive. I think it's control. He just w- goes for the ball and bumps him down. But then for him to start whinging and moaning, can't really have that. Because, I don't know, he goes and gets booked because he's still like whinging about it to the referee. I think you need to accept that and move on. Um, but, I mean, that's all there is to say on that, really. That's how they, they let in the goal. But Ralph Hassan Huttle's changes that he made at halftime, he's got, a, I would say, a much worse team than Manchester United player. To player. It's a very controversial thing to say, I know. But then he makes changes at halftime to make sure that they don't fall away because United looked like they might get back into it really early, that Greenwood goal. And they might just drive on. So with lesser players, uh, with smart tactical changes, um, he managed to get a good, a great performance out of his players and a good result. Isn't that the kind of thing Arsenal might want to have? Isn't that what they should have? A Ralph Hassan Huttle? Yeah, quite possibly. But hands off. Thank you. I wonder. He looked like a I kind of Amish dad who'd been at a wedding. He did look like he'd just been to a wedding. It was amazing. What was it when you have to manage the Thampton Manchester United at two, but... Yeah, get back to a wedding at five. He, um, I think, I think the thing with Ralph is he's obviously so the use of Lee Romento, for example. You know, Carl Walker Peters was was one of the better Southampton players last season, um, by some distance, in fact. You know, with particularly his ball carrying, his ability to kind of break into space down that right hand side, and we were overly full back oriented, and I think that caused defensive problems. Mm. Clearly, Hassan Hootl as a manager is like, no, no, no. Livermento's the guy. Like, he's not, he's, he's not afraid to make bold decisions. Um, and I think that that is, that's a really good sign that he's putting faith in his players. You know, that it was an unchanged team after the Everton defeat. He makes good adjustments sometimes. Um, I think sometimes over, I think... I think the strategy is sometimes stuck with for too long. Like Southampton do drop off after the 60th minute, which is understandable for pressing teams. Yeah, but I really expected them to fall in that second half. I just thought it would is exactly I, what I, would happen. I thought after the first like half an hour, I thought it was going to be a bloodbath. Honestly, <laughs> I was so I was getting That's so real getting miserable. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I think a it's I think it's blood. really sensible. The, the issue that Southampton have is that that. 5-3-2 worked really well. Like yeah. it makes the most out of two wing backs who are aggressive and want to get forwards. Perro got something like 11 assists in Liga last season, tearing up on the left-hand side. It allows for the front two to play together and I thought Armstrong looked really lively. Uh, Adams again. He's been decent. Yeah. Sensible recruitment as well. I remember yeah. in a, a few football managers ago, he was really highly rated as Newcastle youth. Mm, exactly. He did well last season at Blackburn. Uh he, do, he doesn't look at all out of place and he yeah. presses like there are 
you, you can see why he was bought as a kind of Ings-ish player. You know, these little darting, pressing runs, that busyness, that bustly movement. Um, the only issue is that we've signed Theo Walcott to, I assume, a fairly big contract. Um, we've got Gineppo, we've got Alianusi, we've got Stuart Armstrong. You know, there are there are decent wide players, and if you use a five three two, where do you accommodate them? I would I would put Armstrong in as an eight slash ten, maybe instead of Diallo. I think there's something in that system, but we need to come up with a number for that eight slash ten. That's what we'll do. Nine. <laughs> it is in the middle of them, I suppose. Which is the one eight? The other one. Seven. Seven, eight, nine. Are you referring to a... Oh. Ate it. Yeah. Um, speaking of eating, which was the better goal this weekend? Was it Reese James's goal against Arsenal? Or was it Danny Ings' bicycle kick? And before you answer, we're going to take a short break. And we're back. Danny Ings' bicycle kick. <laughs> it's it so good. What? I mean, so what good. a goal. Like, have you ever tried to do that in real life, that bicycle kick? Do I look like someone who would have tried to do that in real life? I've tried to do it. <laughs> My cigarette would drop yeah. out. <laughs> um, it's really hard. So well done, Danny Ings, for scoring. That goal is ridiculous. Yeah. So if you have not seen it yet, you'll be able to find it on the internet, I believe. I think Aston Villa tweeted it. So do that. Do that, not now, but soon. Um, let's move on from the Premier League and talk Inter Milan 4 nil Genoa. Because Inter, written here, were VG. Mm. Please tell me what that means. VG means very good. Ah. Yeah. Um, it was, well, okay. The, the reason I found this interesting was obviously Inter have a new coach uh, in Simeone and Zaghi. Uh, I remember him when he used to play for Lazio. Right. Um, and then went on to coach them quite successfully. Yes. Um, Conte's gone. Lukaku's gone. Inter are a financial mess. Their owner's you know, uh, have sort of turned the tap off. A lot of players appear to be available for sale or something. You know, I mm. I've talked about Latura Martinez not being, not leaving, but so I was kind of going into this game thinking, how are they going to cope? They've got Ed and Jacko up front, who's old as the hills. Um, <laughs> and they've lost Hakimi. What a young hill though. Who, well, I should think hills are, I mean, Ed and Jack are younger of years than old. me, so I don't know <laughs> what I'm saying. But um, so yeah, they've you know they've lost the best right wing back in Italy. They've lost the best striker in Italy. Right? What's going to happen? They looked awesome. Is what's going to happen? Uh, Danny Ings's goal was very good. It is also worth checking out Chalanolu's goal. Um, for, I think it was the second goal Inter scored. Um, but there was just this wonderful constant rotation in midfield felt like the only fixed positions really in in through the spine of the team were mm -hmm. Dzeko up front and Brozovic screening the back three. Everyone else could kind of go where they wanted to go. Is that changing change in system completely, was it? Because Conte was always 3-5-2, was he with a... Yeah, so it was it was a 3-5-1-1 one, one, um, with Stefano Sensi or Chalanolu playing off Dzeko. Um, largely That's Sensi, forward. actually. Yeah. Um, I think Martinez will come back into that team, whether he'll play as a front two or not. So there were that you could understand, like he was asking players to do things that they were sort of used to positionally from Conte, mm -hmm. but it was a lot less structured than than Conte. Um, Barella was all over the place, no, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Like it, it was one of those games where you can you can see these rotations happening and you can see players popping up hither and thither, but it, it never to the degree that it feels like the structure is weakened. It sounds almost like a natural progression of what Conte's would maybe needed to have become anyway, I suppose. I think that's right. And I, and I think it's an adaptation that's maybe occurred in order to play off Dzeko because Dzeko is very good at certain things and he's not very good at other things. Like he's not very mobile, is he? So you're not going to get those sort of Lukaku movements. Yeah. But what you are going to get is, I mean, he set up two, maybe three shots with chest downs, which was just great to watch. <laughs> Something incredibly old school about this kind of guy. Massive guy taking a ball into his chest, pumping it off, and then someone <laughs> running in to shoot. Um, but yeah, I, Inter looked really good, really good. Genoa, rubbish. 
well, something else that was either rubbish or really good depend no, it's definitely rubbish, was um in Nice versus Marseille, the game was abandoned, is that correct? Mm. Because I believe Dimitri Payet had a bottle thrown at him and his response was to throw the bottle back yeah. at the fan. Now this sounds like a bad idea. It's not a great idea. I mean I think you can you can understand the frustration, maybe, of a player that is subject to that. I mean, anyone throwing anything at you, it, it breaks that wall between... Although supporters can sort of come over the... I mean, technically, <laughs> and I shouldn't say this, you may let people know they can do this, but, you know, the only thing that bounds or stops you from getting onto the pitch is that you don't do it, really. Yeah, yeah. So when that wall's broken and someone throws a coin or, or something like that, it's... It removes that, I suppose, illusion of safety that you have being it's on the pitch. It's a violation of the fourth wall. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, yes, well, there was no illusion of safety in this game because Nice fans then responded to this by storming the pitch and trying to attack Marseille players. Oh, that sounds very bad, yeah. So it, it kind of all went... What What was weird about it was that the the referee, I think, was caught in this very awkward position, tried to restart the game which resulted in this very bizarre picture of Nice setting up to defend a corner with no Marseille players on the pitch, which, yes, tr it's on Twitter, trust me, it, it was a thing. Um, but yes, I Nice, because Marseille refused to come back out, Nice have been awarded the game 3-0 at the point that we are recording. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine a world in which that stands because... This was basically caused by them. Having said that, also, Marseille didn't cover themselves in glory because one of their coaching staff went and punched a Nice fan in the throat, it looks like, allegedly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, these are all things you shouldn't do. Yeah. To be clear, you shouldn't do any of these Don't things. Don't do any of these Don't things. Do any it's of just these. unnecessary. It ruins the game for everyone else. It's very... Violence is never good. That's correct. It's never good. Uh, I can't think of it. It's Street Fighter Two. Then it's useful. Yeah. Okay. It w within the world of arcade games, is Street Fighter an arcade game? It was originally, yes, but I think it didn't really gain popularity until Street Fighter Two came out, and it was a big hit in the arcades. But I think it really kind of cemented its place in the legacy of of not football video games, just video games, when it was because it was famously on. I call it the SNES, the Super Nintendo. But you call it SNES, isn't it? That's what I would call it. I yeah. call it SNES. And the Mega Drive. Yeah. And I think a lot of people played Super Street Fighter 2. Like, it's super. It was like bonus editions so that had extra characters that you could play as M. Bison. Because the one I had in the SNES, you couldn't be M. Bison. So when I was at my friend's house playing on the Mega Drive, and it's like, M. Bison? Wow. Yeah. You could be Sagat. Tiger! And also you could be... Uh, oh, who's a tiger? It is Sagat, isn't it? I don't... I don't know. Tiger Robocut! I remember playing... Tiger! I played Duck Hunter... Duck Hunter on the NES. That yeah. sounds, was that less or more violent than Street Fighter Two? You shot ducks. But what's more violent, punching a monster from Brazil in the face as he electrocutes you, or shooting a duck? I'd say shooting. I don't. I don't know. It's hard to answer that. It's an impossible question to answer, and I think a great way to finish the Tifo Football Podcast. And uh, so with that. I bid you adieu. And I say thank you to Alex Stewart. That's, I mean, it's been something. It certainly it? has. It's a shame that Seb, someone is trying to drill into Seb's house. And we hope that um, that goes well for you, Seb. And uh, yeah, so that's us this week. Yeah. Thanks very much for watching or listening or both. And I hope you all have just a lovely time. Mm -hmm.